please join me in welcoming our panelists and our moderator, Pradeep Kashyap. Thank you. Before we start, let me uh, introduce my fellow panelists. From the right, uh, uh, those of you who haven't seen the new flyers, we've lost two panelists and recruited two in the last 18 hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, my colleague and friend, Mark Sidel, who's a professor at the University of Wisconsin, he has uh, stayed on, so his uh, resume is right here. The important things to note is that Mark has worked uh, in Delhi, Beijing, uh, Hanoi, and Bangkok. So he has a global perspective on the subject that we are discussing today. Uh, now, next to Mark is Shushma Raman, and thank you Shushma for stepping in uh, at the last minute. And uh, very similar in some respects, uh, with, and both Mark and Shushma had worked previously at the Ford Foundation and have run programs uh, to develop philanthropy. And that is the reason they are on this panel. Uh, Shushma is in fact doing a mid-career program at the Kennedy School. Uh, prior to this, she was the president of Southern California Ground Makers Association. Uh, and the other person who bailed this out is Raj Sharma. Raj is uh, a senior private wealth management person uh, working with Merrill Lynch out of Boston. Uh, given the weather conditions, we had to do some local recruitment. And uh, Raj, uh, besides uh, his resume doesn't show it, but uh, he is also a trustee and a board member of the American India Foundation. Um, and uh, so Raj understands philanthropy and how it works in the United States and that qualifies him to be on this panel. Now sadly we do not have a philanthropist uh, from India, uh, but uh, we will try and make up for that. Uh, and so the way we were going to do it is each of us were going to make some brief comments and then there will be a few questions and answers and then we uh, open the floor for all of you to participate. Okay, so now before we start, I thought I'll just take a, a, a second uh, to just define philanthropy which talks about the word, Latin word, love of humanity. It is meant to be a private initiative for public good which typically focuses on quality of life. And some of us would like to go further and differentiate philanthropy from charity. Charity, we like to think, is from the heart. Uh, and philanthropy is more from the mind and the heart. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard all about uh, giving a person fish or teaching a person how to fish. I mean, that's the meant to be the differentiator or that's what we like to talk in the philanthropy space, the def difference between philanthropy and charity. Now, the subject today we have is what's happening in India. And what I'd like to do is uh, tell you a small story. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a meeting with, uh, when I say we, I mean some of us from the American India Foundation, had a session with the founders and the, uh, the leadership of one of the most uh, respected nonprofits in India, who were in the middle of celebrating the 30th anniversary and wanted to raise a endowment of $30 million. And curiously, they decided they wanted to come to the United States to get this endowment put together. Now, I'll step back a little bit and I'll tell you the AIF experience. The American India Foundation has been around for about 12 years. We've raised in excess of $80 million. We uh, run five signature programs in India 
And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, our board felt very strongly that, you know, when we go around trying to raise funds from the diaspora here in the United States, the constant feedback we get is, you know, there is so much wealth being created in India. There are so many very rich people in India. Why don't we work on getting the Indian uh, philanthropists match what the diaspora philanthropists put up on the table? Uh, so here, we in the United States who have in a transparent way trying to build a platform which, uh, uh, for the diaspora to give back to India, trying to go to India to fundraise, yet one of the most respected nonprofits in India wants to come and raise money in India. United States. So here is the interesting uh, contradiction, juxtaposition of what the people in India think and what we sitting here in the United States think. Uh, and we hope some of these uh, contradictions or, uh, 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 you know, misunderstandings or, uh, or, or different ways of seeing the same reality uh, can get surfaced. Now, one other point that I wish to point out here that uh, the discussion on philanthropy is typically focused on individuals, but we think that uh, besides individuals, corporate philanthropy is also important. And the landscape in India is shifting there as well. Uh, recently, the government has put together uh, a bill that is attempting to persuade corporates of a certain size to set aside 2% of the net profits, which they have uh, uh, defined how these funds will be deployed into the development sector. And, and, and that landscape is also shifting uh, uh, quite rapidly in India. So with these opening comments, Mark, uh, you know, uh, we try to, as panels do, uh, have a little discussion. And so we are gonna, I'm going to ask our panelists to speak for a few minutes each. And let's hope they don't speak about the same thing, because remember, this panel has come together. It's a pop-up panel. so. <laughs> we, we hope. Last minute pitch hitters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, Mark, why don't you start with some observations uh, and, and then we can pick up from there. Thank you, Cash. I'm delighted to be here and my thanks to the organizers for their terrific organization of this <clears throat> latest episode in the Harvard India conferences, which now have a long history of promoting understanding of India and Indian US relations. So my thanks to the organizers, and of course, I'm delighted and honored to be on a panel with Cash, whom all of us know for his extraordinary work with AIF uh, and in diaspora philanthropy work in India, uh, with Mr. Raj Sharma, who's also had a distinguished career both in the United States and in work with India, and with my former colleague, Mr. Sushma from the Ford Foundation, uh, who has extensive experience in philanthropy both in India and in the United States. Let me make a few comments raise a few questions, issues that I know are of perhaps some use or importance both in the Indian philanthropic sector, uh, but also in the United States, and then turn it over after just a couple minutes to the next speaker who Cash asked to speak. Uh, first is the question of the diversity of philanthropy and the purposes of philanthropy, both in India and the United States. Uh, we want to honor and encourage philanthropy for extraordinarily diverse purposes and we want to permit philanthropists and philanthropic institutions to focus on what they believe are the most important causes that they're interested in ameliorating. That may mean for the Gates Foundation working on HIV AIDS in India, it may mean for other foundations 
working on issues of social justice and governance more directly, economic inequality, as was raised by several of the questions on the previous panel. We do want to honor that diversity, and we don't want to take steps either as a field or uh, allow our governments to take steps that would narrow that diversity and channel philanthropy into certain kinds of accepted purposes. Having said that, there is a tension in philanthropy between working on solutions to specific problems and working on the broader underlying causes of those problems. Uh, a distinction, a tension that Mr. Alexander uh, identified very eloquently in terms of the proximal or the distal causes of the issues that give rise to the philanthropic impulse. And I think one of the issues before us is the fact that much of the philanthropy in India, both by the foreign philanthropic actors and by the domestic philanthropic actors, does tend to focus on technical and highly measurable solutions to very specific problems, when some of the underlying issues that our Indian colleagues identify do relate to issues of governance and social justice. And that's a tension, a set of issues that I think runs through the philanthropic community, not only in India and the United States as well. Second is the need for what we sometimes call intermediary organizations in philanthropy. In the United States, we have the Council on Foundations, which represents the philanthropic community in trying to uh, retain better treatment, tax treatment, and other kinds of treatment from the government. We have a group called the Foundation Center in New York, which gathers data on philanthropy. Those intermediary organizations, uh, information gathering organizations, knowledge creation organizations, even lobbying organizations, have been very important to the growth, sustainability, and strength of the philanthropic sector in the United States. We do see them developing in other countries as well. We see them developing in India. Uh, groups that many of you know, like the Center for Advancement of Philanthropy, run by Nushir Dadarwal in Mumbai, uh, or other groups in Delhi. But as the philanthropic sector in India grows, I think many of us have been hoping and working toward a similar growth of intermediary organizations that can serve that rapidly growing sector, help to unite it, help to make the case to the government for flexible policies toward philanthropy and charitable work, and undertake the cause of growing the sector that goes beyond individual foundations or individual philanthropists toward growing the sector as a whole. Third, I'll stop after a couple minutes. Third, I want to come back to, the, uh, to what Mr. Alexander so usefully referred to as the hope model or the questions of tipping point in philanthropy. These are questions that I face directly and I think Sushma faced directly when we worked at the Ford office in India. Uh, the contradiction between relatively small funding for demonstration programs or programs in very particular sites and the difficulty of scaling up replicability, uh, taking successful models where they're successful and they're not always successful <clears throat> toward more regional or even more national applicability. Closely related to the question of tipping point, when does small change become broader change? I think that's a, a consistent tension, focus, challenge for philanthropy in every country, including India and including the United States. Fourth, I'll come back briefly to something that we may discuss more, which is the regulatory framework and government policy toward philanthropy and the nonprofit sector in India. In India, as in China, as in the United States, uh, governments tend to try to channel and mold the philanthropic and nonprofit sector toward the kinds of activities that government would like to see philanthropy and the nonprofit sector undertaking. So perhaps more focus on education or healthcare, and perhaps through a regulatory molding process, less focus on advocacy, social justice. We see that in a number of different countries. I see that very specifically in my work in China, for example. So the questions of the strength of the regulatory framework and the directions in which the regulatory framework is pushing or channeling the nonprofit sector and philanthropy are important questions in many countries. In recent years, in India as well as other countries, we've also seen the growth of what we call self-regulation in the philanthropic and nonprofit sector. Groups of nonprofits, groups of foundations coming together to try, in some cases, to ward off, to prevent stricter government regulation by regulating transparency, accountability, 
quality control within their own sector. We see multiple models for this in India. Uh, India is perhaps the most diverse and the most energetic in developing new models of non-profit and philanthropic, particularly non-profit self-regulation of any country in Asia and perhaps beyond. That relationship between government regulation and the increase in self-regulation by the non-profit and philanthropic sector, I think, is an area to watch. And then fifth, I keep glancing at Cash because at some point he's just going to shut me down, which is fun. Um, but uh, but I've, I've worked on and off with Cash now for a long time, so I'll probably just keep talking until he tells me to stop. Um, the fifth is the uh, increased focus in recent years, and I have to speak carefully here, on uh, HNWIs, high net worth individuals, an acronym that virtually all of you know, uh, and social enterprise. That's a worthwhile focus. It's a focus of research. It's a focus of the annual Bain reports on philanthropy in India, the high net worth individual, the, wealthy, the role of wealthy philanthropists is obviously important. The role of center, social enterprise and social entrepreneurship is obviously important as well. But I want to caution that as we focus on high net worth individuals and their philanthropy, and as we focus on social enterprise, that we should remember that in India, as in China, as in the United States, this is one piece of a broader philanthropic and non-profit community and puzzle. And we should be careful, at least in my personal view, uh, not to narrow our focus as it sometimes appears uh, to the work that wealthy people are doing in philanthropy and to the work of social entrepreneurship. As you all know, the diversity of philanthropy and nonprofit activity in India goes far beyond the work of the wealthy and the work of social entrepreneurs, important though that is. There is philanthropy being carried out by the poor, there is philanthropy being carried out by the middle class, there's philanthropy being carried out in both religious and secular communities. I don't need to say any of this to this audience. Uh, but I want to uh, inject a brief cautionary note that sometimes there is a tendency, uh, and sometimes there's a particular tendency in the United States these days to focus or narrow our attention to HNWI philanthropy and social entrepreneurship, and there's much more going on, as you all know. Let me stop there because uh, because Cash has given me a look and I've learned over the years to interpret those looks and this look says uh, it's time to stop talking. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, you know, uh, philanthropy uh, is an act of giving and so often we think of giving as only wealth, giving of wealth. But uh, broadly defined, uh, philanthropy also implies giving of wisdom and giving of work, of, of your time. And in fact, because of that, in India, the sector is often referred to as the voluntary sector, uh, which, is some, uh, which is sort of unique uh, in India because it's called the non-profit sector here. Anyway, uh, Shushma, your floor. Great. Um, thanks, uh, Cash. And, um Looking forward to connecting with all of you today. I'd love to get a sense of who's in the room. How many people here are students, either the Kennedy or business or one of the other schools? Right. And how many are working in the NGO philanthropic space in India? And um, I guess I would just say other <laughs> um, government. Um, and the rest are all speakers. All oh, speakers. Okay, very important. VIP, as they say in India, VVIP. Um, so I'm going to say a few remarks about what I see as the opportunities and challenges for uh, building a more robust philanthropic sector in India. Um, there's several opportunities at this point. Uh, as all of you know, India is the world's largest democracy and uh, we often take for granted the ability to form associations, but in many countries that are more totalitarian in nature, you don't even have the ability to create uh, voluntary organizations or philanthropic associations. So this is something that uh, we take for granted in uh, countries such as India or the United States, but it's really a real great opportunity. Related to that is that India has a very vibrant and robust civil society. So beyond the NGO space, you have social movements, trade unions, uh, women's self-help groups. There's such a large network and universe of 
uh, organizations and um, there's such a robust sort of history and tradition uh, cash referred to the voluntary sector you know a lot of that has Gandhian roots in terms of sort of the legacy of um, you know people organizing around uh, the aspirations and goals of uh, people in India uh, the third opportunity I would say is the growing middle class and the affluent um, over the past few decades, we've seen a tremendous rise in the middle class and tremendous rise in high net worth individuals. And that really provides an opportunity for philanthropy to become more institutionalized. There was always philanthropy happening where people would give individually to temples or mosques or the, uh, you know, people in their community. But now you see it being expressed through more institutionalized forms, whether it's the establishment of a foundation or a trust or giving to a company. Um, uh, but you see the, the institutionalization of philanthropy through the changing uh, income demographics. Um, and finally, I think there is an opportunity for philanthropy in India to develop at this juncture, given the sort of historical trajectory of foreign uh, philanthropy in India. Um, the, uh, the Ford Foundation where I worked was invited by Nehru to, um, to open an office in India. It was the first overseas office for Ford, uh, you know, soon after India got independence. And uh, over time, you've seen bilaterals, multilaterals, private foundations and trusts. Um, but there's also been um, sort of an expression over time around uh, the role of foreign foundations, the, uh, the agenda of Western donors, uh, particularly around social justice and human rights issues. So I do think there's a, a, an opportunity for uh, philanthropy in India to uh, really develop more robustly to uh, uh, raise issues and address some of the challenges that perhaps uh, Western donors cannot uh, directly uh, address. So th there are some challenges, of course, uh, at this juncture, um, and I'll highlight a few. The first is really the perception of um, NGO accountability. Uh, this is a challenge that I think many donors um, fear about, and they wonder how their resources are used. Uh, they wonder whether it's better for them to start their own projects or fund their own initiatives or build their own buildings rather than investing in existing NGOs. And I think that um, what philanthropy really needs to do is in addition to funding programs is also invest in the infrastructure for the NGO sector. So donors shouldn't just say we'll fund you for the help, but they should also fund for the organization and the sector to have the infrastructure to be accountable and transparent. Uh, the second challenge is really the perception of, uh, around governance um, and uh, corruption. And um, I think there's a role then for foundations and philanthropy to fund work around uh, budget transparency, uh, participatory democracy. So again, not just funding a health project or an education project, which is worthwhile, but really looking at where are government funds being utilized, how effectively are they being utilized, and, and um, you know, how can we hold uh, those uh, activities uh, accountable? The third is the enabling environment, which Mark has touched on, he's gonna go into in more detail, but really looking at what is the legal regulatory framework for philanthropy in the nonprofit sector, and how can it be strengthened to really uh, promote uh, such activity? And the final challenge, really, I would say, is to the scale of the issues. It can be daunting uh, when you're working in a country that's as complex, diverse, and, uh, uh, you know, and large as India, as 40% of the world's poor, uh, you know, you, uh, for every statement you can make, the opposite is also true. So I think um, philanthropists really have to enter this thinking that their resources are best uh, deployed if they collaborate with others in the sector, as well as with NGO partners, and also looking at what are the state interventions in the field. Um, you know, very often philanthropists want to go it alone or they think they've invented the next best thing. But really, I think uh, to be most effective to address the challenge of scale and complexity, it involves partnership collaboration. And I'll just close by saying that um, I think the best uh, philanthropic efforts are those that are approached with that spirit of collaboration, as well as openness to learning. Uh, I do think NGOs working in the field, uh, community organizations, have a rich uh, and diverse body of knowledge from which uh, philanthropists can draw that uh, people don't have to read and defend the wheel. A lot of the information, resources, talent is out there. And uh, philanthropy can best play a role not just by providing funding, but also by connecting and leveraging uh, knowledge. Thank you. Answers well. Raj, why don't you make your comments? Well, it's, it's not easy to go after the, the, you know, follow these two distinguished people here. Uh, I'm not, I don't work in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I'm in 
the wealth management sector, but over the past uh, you know, 25 years, I've been at the intersection of you know, wealth creation, preservation, but more importantly, giving. Uh, we have clients who are involved in uh, you know, foundations, and community foundations, setting up their private foundations. And what we have in the U.S., I think, is something extraordinary. We've got a great ecosystem. And it didn't come about overnight. It came about after you know, 75 years of continuous economic growth, barring a few recessions and a few crises here and there. India has not had the benefit of that. So the U.S. has had a, you know, a tremendous ecosystem best practices, their foundations, and organizations which work together. And something like 4% of our GDP goes towards philanthropy in the US. And many of my clients give as much as, say, 5 to 10% of their income to their foundation or to charitable causes. And I think it's, again, this culture that hasn't come about overnight. And that's an important thing to recognize. Uh, as India goes about its you know, journey, the area of philanthropy. Uh, I'm actually quite encouraged. I spent two and a half weeks in India along with cash, not too long ago, last month. And uh, you know, for the first time, I got a, an opportunity uh, to see you know, the work being done on the ground by many NGOs and nonprofits in India. And it's really exciting. You know, what's happening in India today is, is, uh, is something you know, people have to really be there to experience. Number one, you know, India's trajectory of growth has been extraordinary. Six to seven percent growth is something we would kill for in the U.S. You know, this economy is growing at maybe one and a half percent. Europe is declining this year, probably growing at one percent. So six percent means that essentially you're doubling your economy every 12 years. Uh, India is in the top 12 in the world in terms of growth of high net wealth individuals. These are individuals with more than a million dollars of investable assets outside their home. That means these individuals, you know, we all know about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, once people take care of uh, shelter, food, they want to give back. They want to uh, be in the self-actualization mode. And I think India is in that trajectory. Uh, it may be only 150 or 200,000 individuals right now in India in this bracket, but that is growing at the rate of 15 to 20 percent a year as opposed to 2 or 3 percent in the developed world. So another 5 to 10 years, we have a huge kind of people who are able to give, who have a lot of discretionary income. So that is a very uh, promising development. The other development, and I know Sush Panamak, you've seen it, is the growth of NGOs in India. And it's amazing that, uh, that, again, these are numbers which I got from a few reports. And 10 years ago, there were 300,000 NGOs in India, and today there are three million NGOs in India. And the United States only has 1.5 million NGOs. So it goes to show that there's a firm, there's a zeal for making a positive kind of change in India. People want to give back. And uh, you know, everywhere around, when, I, when you go to India, you, know, you can see uh, potential for a thousand non-profits. You know. uh, there are massive social problems in India. There's massive growth in India. And it's a contradiction in many ways. Uh, like how you know, Ashok had pointed uh, you know, made in his remarks about India sort of is a dichotomy in so many you know, ways. Uh, massive wealth and massive poverty at the same time. Um, my sense is India has to sort of transition from sort of more of family philanthropy. You know, you've had industrialists in India who give money, but they give to you know, sort of their family businesses or they take care of their employees in their factory, that kind of thing. And that's been going on for a while. So we need to go from that to more sort of collective and individual philanthropy. And the best thing which uh, organizations like AIF can do is serve as a model for philanthropy. Uh, our main, uh, being the board of AIF, uh, we're we trying to pivot the organization gradually to raising money in India. Right now, 90% of the money we raise comes from the United States, all being deployed in India. So how do we encourage and motivate Indian philanthropists, wealthy people in India, to give in their own backyard? And I don't think anybody quite has the winning model, but that's something we are sort of working towards. Uh, and you know, Cash and I and uh, you know, the board members are certainly working towards that. 
And we also want to create a model for you know, governance where, uh, number one, you know, one of the reasons I joined AIF was uh, I was looking for a long time for an organization which was transparent, which was accountable, and which had you know, good practices. And most of the people involved in AIF come from the business world. So they believe not just in philanthropy for philanthropy's sake, but philanthropy that has an impact, more strategic in nature. And that's what attracted me. And I think if we can play a role there in talking about best practices and uh, talking about models for governance, which NGOs in India, there's no shortage of NGOs. It's a shortage of sort of ideas and models and getting people involved. But overall, uh, it's incredibly encouraging in spite of all the problems, uh, you know, in terms of governance. And you mentioned the word NGO to people in India, they immediately think of corruption. And so it, it doesn't have a, a good sort of um, you know, image associated with it. And I think it's a, it's a problem of a, of a country which is going through these, you know, a growth phase. And I think uh, over time, uh, I think India will sort of graduate to sort of a more of a, a US-based model. I look at cell phones in India. You know, 10 years ago, you had 50 million cell phones. Today, you have a, almost a billion cell phones. And so that kind of trajectory where you know you sort of approach that J curve in India can happen in philanthropy. So it's a question of talking, it's a question of propagating the best practices. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, let me uh, get a little discussion going here. Uh, uh, Raj, you talked about the ecosystem, and I think that is uh, uh, pointed out by the Bain report or other reports. Uh, and they make a specific reference to uh, the, the taxation uh, uh, infrastructure, the practices, uh, if one can contrast to what happens in the US and what happens in India. Uh, uh, Mark, can I ask uh, you if you could speak a little bit about or tell us uh, what you know about contrasting what's happening in India to what may be happening in China or Brazil in so far as issue of addressing the ecosystem to encourage philanthropy. Thanks, Kash. I think. Um, on the question of China, which I work in very extensively and know a bit more about than Brazil, um, we see some commonalities and some differences with the development of philanthropy and the philanthropic ecosystem between the two countries. There is relatively little doubt that there is more diversity, both in terms of sources of philanthropy and in the objects of philanthropy, in India than we are currently seeing in China. Philanthropy in India has a much longer history, a much richer and diverse history than organized philanthropy in China. Uh, part of that is the result of politics over the past 40, 50 years in China, for reasons you all know, involving the one-party operation and the, um, the refusal of the system in China to allow much of a role for the social and especially the philanthropic sector over many years until recently. We've seen significant growth in China in the philanthropic sector, particularly in the last 10 years, uh, as we have over the last 10 or 20 years uh, in India. Um, and so some commonalities, as I said, and differences emerge. Um, one commonality that comes to mind is the preference for reasons of accountability and transparency and trust, uh, a commonality that philanthropists in both countries often tend to prefer what we call operating programs to what we call grant-making programs. Meaning that philanthropists in both countries, and this is a commonality between China and India, um, prefer to run their own programs in many cases uh, rather than to make grants to NGOs or other trusted partners to run programs for themselves. Um, India and China are very different in many ways, uh, but this question of the trust of the NGO community, accountability and transparency in the NGO community, uh, is an issue that uh, is an important one for philanthropists in both countries. Uh, Mark, is, is there some specific uh, things you see on issues of taxation? Both countries, um, including China, uh, and actually including Brazil, uh, seek to encourage uh, funds to go into philanthropy, 
uh, through a certain limited system of tax deductions. India is currently more generous in that system than China is. In China, there have been significant debates with, and none of you will be surprised at this, the tax revenue authorities, the Ministry of Finance, holding back on expanding the deductions and exemptions that are available for the philanthropic and donor sector. So currently, the situation in India is actually considerably better uh, for the tax regime uh, than it is in China. Um, but it's still not quite as friendly as it is in the US. Not at all. Not at all. We still see limits in India, and India, as many of you know, has a regime involving the regulation of foreign donations uh, that is actually more limiting than the regime for foreign donations that exists in China and a number of other countries. That's the so-called FCRA system that many of you are very familiar with. Certainly those of you who work in the NGO sector uh, are familiar with. So we see some contradictions in terms of tax policy, a more liberal tax policy for bringing funds into philanthropy in India than in China, but the overlay of a system uh, that regulates foreign donations, which as you know goes back to the emergency period, uh, which is actually more extensive in India than it is in China, despite the fact that China is ostensibly a one-party state. Uh, Shishma, you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add that actually now in this current uh, sort of fiscal crisis in the US, the, the issue of the general tax deduction keeps coming back on the table as to whether those get capped in some way or they get eliminated for certain kinds of donations. So for example, you know, why should a donation to a multi-billion dollar uh, you know, university or a hospital or a national football league, you know, why should every nonprofit be treated the same as an you know, uh, organization that provides social, social services? So there's, there's sort of a debate around that, both in the, within the nonprofit sector as well as within government to change that. But, you know, the issue of taxation is a little bit of a double-edged sword because what it means is every, uh, you know, depending on the level of deductions, it means a loss in government revenue. So then the question is, um, is it better to ensure that government is effective in delivering services to the poor and sort of delivering on its promises of social justice? Uh, you know, India, unlike other countries, has an explicit commitment to social justice, empowerment, development, you know, in the Constitution. So is it better to ensure that government is effective and efficient versus finding uh, private solutions to what are essentially public problems? Uh, uh, Raj, you mentioned that uh, uh, the number of 3 million NGOs in India. In fact, uh, 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 the data that I was looking at said 3.5 million. Okay. So maybe you were, your data is 6 months old. <laughs> 6 months old. Uh, so, I think one of the challenges that keeps coming up, and Shushma, you referred to it, uh, is that there are so many NGOs, they're all trying to do great things, uh, but we do know that the majority of these NGOs are, in fact, uh, do not follow the best practices of transparency, accountability, uh, and, and uh, have... Uh, political or other motives that, uh, you know, they couch uh, those objectives uh, with a front of social good. Um, so, uh, Sushma, if you can specifically comment uh, uh, on what can be done from an ecosystem standpoint, I mean, you were in a way a grant maker in, uh, in India working with Ford, uh, what was your learning there, or what could be done there uh, to enhance the ecosystem on this issue? You know, I saw a real dichotomy between uh, many of the groups that were being supported by Ford that were doing incredible work on a range of issues, microenterprise, you know, women's rights, you, you name the issue, and then sort of the popular perception that all NGOs are corrupt and all NGOs, you know, are lining their pockets or hiring their family members. And of course that does happen, you know, um, but um, I think what um, uh, funders can do is really collaborate with each other. Like when I was uh, at Ford in Delhi, we collaborated a lot with other trusts and foundations, uh, bilaterals, uh, SRTT, uh, Saratan Tata Trust, uh, Dorabji Tata Trust, others to just share information. So I think um, that's something that's very useful for if you're in the foundation world to do where you share information on what you know about uh, the groups that you're supporting 
um, through your visits, through your financial due diligence, and so on, because that then helps create sort of a community of best practice that you can allocate to other donors. And if you're in the NGO sector, I think, uh, you know, there have been different efforts around transparency and so on, and all of those are limited to a certain extent, because just because you put your, uh, you know, financials on your website, it doesn't mean you're more effective. Or if you served up, you know, one lakh people versus two lakh, is the, you know, is that group that served more, more effective. But I think NGOs also have to, um, you know, take it upon themselves to set up internal best practices around governance, uh, conflict of interest, uh, you know, financial transparency, and so on, in order to ensure that uh, the sector as a whole is seen in a more credible light. Now, uh, you know, uh, Shushma, one more question of you. I think, uh, as as Raj uh, was pointing out, the very rapid growth of uh, well-to-do people, rich people, uh, and sooner or later, uh, they will gravitate. As they age, they will gravitate towards giving. Uh, uh, and, and so what can be the role of intermediate organizations or support organizations? Uh, and so, for example, you were running the uh, Southern California Grant Makers Association. In some ways, uh, a lot of grant makers came together and were sort of uh, 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 getting a group like the one that you were running uh, to support them of how to do better, uh, how to do better grant making, uh, or how to facilitate uh, 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 better interventions. Could you comment on that in terms of are there or did you see any intermediate uh, organizations coming together in India which would facilitate? philanthropy for people who are looking for support and help to, in fact, practice it to the best standards? You know, I think there's a, um, a different approach to giving in India. Like, you know, when Warren Buffett made his announcement that he's going to put his money into Gates, I mean, he had enough money that he could have set up the Warren Buffett Foundation, but no, he chose to sort of partner with somebody else. And I think there's a tendency to go it alone. So, um, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes people feel like they want sort of their own trust, or their own company's uh, foundation and retain control and retain their brand. Um, and uh, no, but that is true for the richest people. But there is there are many less rich people who are, uh, don't have that size of ego yet, uh, and and therefore there is room to collectivize them or room to. Uh, so, for example, I've heard of giving circles. Uh, one shepherded by Dasra and another one that is coming together, the uh, SVP, the, um, uh, the, the group that has just started in Bangalore and opening up in Delhi. Uh, uh, these giving circles, is there scope for giving circles where people of less means, but nevertheless a uh, million and above, as you pointed out, the definition of a high net worth, uh, these people do not have a means to create infrastructures uh, to do intelligent giving uh, or to set up their entire foundation of their own, but nevertheless are at a point in their lives and at a point in their wealth creation curve where they are ready to give. I, I, I'm referring to those. No, I think there's a huge potential for those. Um... There are some infrastructure organizations in India. Uh, a lot of them in the past used to be supported by Ford uh, that provided information, research in the sector, and so on. But I think that convening role has to really be done by people who are peers in the field, where they are seen as sort of insiders and peers, so that uh, they can learn from each other. Uh, and uh, when I was in California, the groups I would convene, I mean, the, the foundations gave a total uh, of about three billion dollars a year. They have about 50 billion in assets. But they ranged in size from the ones which had no staff to those that had hundreds of staff with you know, research, evaluation, capabilities. So it's, it's a whole range. And so part of what you try and do is cross-fertilize the larger with the smaller. Uh, and even then sometimes uh, conflicts occur because people will be like, well, the large one has all these resources. What they can they tell me? And you know, the larger ones feel like they're more sophisticated. Uh, but it's a slow, ongoing process, and I think there's huge potential for activities like giving 
circles or ways to bring together people to share information um, to influence each other's thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unlike the US, where the median, median age for you know, high net worth uh, individual is like in the mid 50s, in India it's like 32. Yes. I mean, that is quite amazing that the bulk of the wealth is being created by a lot of young people. And so they might be much more open to philanthropy as opposed to having the bad habits of, you know, the traditional philanthropists where, you know, you better have the family name associated with it. Yeah, no, I think that is, in fact, uh, if one looks at the, the side of opportunities for philanthropy, that is the most uh, uh, optimistic uh, uh, data point, where that, whilst there is huge growth in high net worth individuals in India, I think what is remarkable is that the age profile of uh, the high net worth growth uh, individual continues to come down in age and, and that is what is the most uh, uh, positive and the most uh, hopeful sign for philanthropy and future for philanthropy in India. Um, and, and I think uh, uh, for us, uh, uh, and I, I, the other thing that I have read is that a number of these young people have, in fact, uh, you know, worked or studied overseas, and therefore they try to bring best practices of, uh, uh, of running their lives and their uh, uh, business and philanthropy with them, and, and, and uh, that uh, contributes to that whole uh, ecosystem. Uh, you know, I there is there is. Um, I go back uh, to this whole issue of accountability, which is, if you talk to most well-to-do people in India, their first response on uh, not practicing philanthropy or a barrier to philanthropy is that issue. Um, um, or you don't know where the money would go, we don't trust the people. Um, is there a role for government or is there a self-governing uh, uh, opportunity here for the NGO sector to improve uh, their uh, public uh, persona. I mean, Mark or Sushma, do you have um, some uh, wisdom on that? I think there's a role for both. And uh, places in which these questions of accountability and transparency uh, are perhaps best handled, where we have some best practices tend to be jurisdictions where there's a role for government and there's a role for the nonprofit and philanthropic community as well. Uh, government needs to enforce standards for annual reporting, uh, needs to enforce standards for financial accountability, needs to enforce laws and regulations that uh, mean that funds available to nonprofit organizations or through philanthropic um, uh, channels uh, are used for the purposes for which they're intended. But increasingly, whether it's in the United States or in India, or actually we're now seeing it just beginning to develop in China as well and in other countries, there's a role for what you're calling the self-governing or the self-regulatory channels as well, in which groups of organizations come together to set standards and, frankly, to push out of that circle those who fail to meet the standards. This can occur in the nonprofit sector. We have several different models for this in India. Uh, it can occur in the philanthropic sector as well. Uh, in China, for example, uh, groups of foundations have come together to promulgate self-regulatory behavior standards or quality standards for the emerging foundation sector. So, in the best situation, it's a role for both government and for the sector itself um, to try to increase accountability and transparency while always keeping in mind that while in the United States or in India or other countries we see lots of newspaper reports about the failings of the NGO community, as Sushma and others on the panel have already reminded us several times, there is a vibrant, highly effective, very strong NGO culture and sector in India that is not subject to these kinds of abuses. Uh, one of the strongest in Asia, one of the strongest in the world, uh, and uh, that kind of NGO culture and effectiveness needs to be maintained as philanthropy increases to support it. Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, we are at the point in our schedule where we have to invite some participation from the audience. So please, uh, if uh, you have questions on uh, uh, the opportunity.
opportunities or challenges? Uh, so are you stretching yourself when you have a... No, no, I... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do I? Wait, but it could be misinterpreted. Um, so famously, uh, two years ago, about this time of year, Manohan Singh said that um, NGOs were blocking India's development through foreign funding, that there are specific allegations about the American soybean industry, there are also allegations about European NGOs, we're trying to block India's development specifically in nuclear power and in um, biotechnology. So I'm curious about two things. Uh, when you get to the accountability in that line between what is a philanthropic or public service or a political project, where does that line get drawn? And how does the government of India respond to the allegations of someone like Moon Singh? What kind of controls are there on foreign funding of organizations in India that are contrary to public law or national interest. And specifically, since I have PhD students in the field right now, is there transparency to the level that we can find out who is funding NGOs? Uh, Mark, you want to start? I think we can all uh, chip in. So. The questions of the transparency and accountability of foreign donations for domestic organizations usually NGOs, but it can also be for academic organizations, it can be to develop philanthropic channels as well. Uh, this question of accountability and transparency for cross-border giving is a question in many countries, and we can't limit that question to India, although there are specific questions that have been raised at specific times in India. Uh, there, there are questions raised about the transparency and the goals of foreign giving uh, for the kinds of business purposes that you uh, indicate, or perhaps business purposes. There have been questions raised, as all of you know, uh, over the years about uh, diaspora giving for various religious or political purposes in India. Um, uh, the, the core goal here, it seems to me, is to uh, have as much clarity and transparency in terms of the funds that are coming into India and the kinds of organizations to which they're going, and that is primarily a governmental task on both sides, um, particularly uh, the side uh, in the United States uh, where funds are coming into the United States or in India for the Indian government where funds are coming into India. That's a very so, difficult process. Yeah. Very you know, difficult the, You're aware there is, a, Mark referred to it earlier, there is this notion of FCRA, which uh, no Indian uh, uh, NGO can uh, accept money from institutional donors from overseas uh, without having prior approval of the government of India. The Home Ministry approves these. Uh, 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 now, uh, so, so there is a, uh, and, and uh, normally, um, NGOs that have an FCRA approval are considered to be uh, a, a notch above uh, the large number of these three and a half million NGOs that exist in India. So uh, the government has a way of uh, uh, approving um, uh, NGOs that can receive foreign money. Yes, Yeah, so if the groups don't have FCRA, then they apply for what's called prior permission. And then they have to submit information on the purpose of the grant as well as information on their own NGO, and the government approves those on the and, and, and they have to disclose where the money is coming from also uh, for prior permission. The, the detail of approval is much more. Uh, and that is meant to be preparing an NGO to receive foreign money, so their disclosures are more. But I think you are also harping on the source of foreign money. If an organization has an FCRA, do they uh, constantly disclose where the money is coming from and what may be the motivation behind it? And, and uh, I, I personally think there's no easy answer to that. Right now we can see two clear threads uh, in climate three. That is, one, the conventional notion that is uh, basic institutions like religious institutions and very fundamental organizations. And then there's this threat of high net worth individuals, which arises from the top of Now there is this, uh, this burgeoning middle class, which falls right into the middle of these two threads, which somehow does not relate it with itself with this very basic thread, that book million kind of notion of civil society, and is not either considered as high network individuals, but they are there. And this sector, this middle income group, is increasing in India. So how do we include them into this process of that? 
it, it's, a, it's a massive population. Yeah, which yeah that, that's the thing. I think it's India's middle class is like 200 million people, or 200, 300, somewhere there. Yeah, more than the population of many countries. Exactly. So like in the US, you have things like United Way, right? The, all, all of us get our paycheck and we can direct the contributions. In India, United Way is actually in India now, doing something similar. So there's got to be an easy way for people to get through organizations and feel that their money is being put to good use. And uh, encouraging, you know, encouraging giving as a corporate culture. You know, a lot of Indians work in the organized sector, the middle class especially. And having those companies understand that it's important to give. Like, you know, the companies here do major campaigns for, you know, various causes. Uh, and uh, I think as that comes about in India, uh, you know, more and more people will <coughs> Also, I would suggest that uh, uh, with the web and internet, you have uh, platforms that have emerged, uh, like uh, Give India, uh, as an example, which makes it easier for people to give less amounts of money with similar sense of comfort and security that it is going to be deployed uh, correctly. Uh, so there is uh, 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 progress on on the on the net on the web. Do have a web low cost solution. So somebody who wants to give only ten thousand rupees uh, or five thousand rupees can still do it with some sense of comfort and confidence that it won't be a mistake. Let me just add to that, Cash. That um, there has been a growth of uh, community foundations, women's funds, and other kinds of public foundations that try to raise money for both individuals and corporates to support. Uh, well, it could, they could also be geographically based. Um, Organizations, there has been an ongoing challenge of uh, demonstrating outcomes, building trust, um, and oftentimes, you know, they end up relying on a few large donors as opposed to getting that middle class that they were initially founded to reach out to. So it's an ongoing issue, but there has been a big growth of those kinds of organizations. There are several sort of smaller women's funds that fund grassroots women's organizations. There's some geographically based uh, foundations as well, and issue for. Let me just add briefly that traditionally we've had extensive knowledge and understanding of what two groups do in philanthropy. One is the poor, and as, as many of you know, the data shows across many countries that when you count in all kinds of charitable donations, donations to community, giving in kind, volunteering, the phrase the poor give more is a phrase that is borne out in many countries by the research. We also have recently very extensive work not necessarily always the highest quality research, but very extensive work on what the HMWIs are doing. Um, what we don't know enough about is the middle class, the large middle class, and the kinds of giving that they're doing. We don't even have an agreed upon definition of what the middle class means in India or even more complex ways, how that would compare to other countries. Last year, a group called the Research Alliance, I'm sorry, the Resource Alliance, which is an international fundraising group, did the first multi-country study, brief study, on middle class giving in a number of countries, including India, China, Russia, Brazil, and I'm missing one, uh, and basically the BRICS countries, uh, and uh, obviously found extensive middle class giving in India, but you've identified a problem, you've all identified a problem, uh, which needs much more understanding and research in the years ahead uh, as we begin to figure out what this middle class is doing, uh, what the constraints and obstacles to their giving are, uh, what some of the possibilities for enhancing giving are, and how to, in effect, segment that community so that we understand better what different parts of that broad middle class and growing middle class community are doing. Thank you. Um, great discussion today, guys. Um, you know, the my question is kind of piggybacking on the previous gentleman's question about, um, you know, you, uh, Mr. Ashram, you talked about this as those pyramid of needs, and a lot of us in the U.S. are privileged to be able to contribute at a very young age, and uh, it's not necessarily a battle for survival, but it's we're in the thriving stage. As a young, my question I guess is, as a, a young aspiring philanthropist uh, with so many opportunities, you said there's about 3 million, 3.5 million, Mr. Kesha, you pointed out later, uh, NGOs in India. Uh, what would be a good direction to focus your energies and really channelize your mind towards in giving, you know, peripheral to your corporate work and um, the culture that's instilled within us? So you, your question is, how do you how do you personally get involved? Personally get involved, and what are the, some of the right opportunities to take? Uh, understanding there's these you know these self governing entities of where to give and is my money going in the right direction and um, where should I focus my efforts towards? Sure. 
with, with the first language, uh, you know, I'll just give you, just briefly, my process of uh, self-discovery when I got involved is, you know, first, before you give money uh, in a big way, you want to get involved with the organization in a volunteer capacity or an advisory capacity. Learn more about the people involved uh, so you get a sense of comfort about the mission of the organization. And uh, giving money is easy, but doing the due diligence on what the organization does uh, is more difficult. So the only way to really understand it is to perhaps get involved with three or four organizations. It'll give you time. And then sort of decide, you know, this is what I have in terms of philanthropic dollars. This is how I'm going to track the business. And there's nothing like giving time, which I think is, you know, far more value. Awareness, awareness, awareness. But we should take a question on this side. Uh, Mr. Sharma briefly mentioned the culture of philanthropy in India in case of family philanthropy and individualistic or more co uh, collective philanthropy. So I had the opportunity of talking to Minister New Delhi last year and he exactly mentioned the same problem. He, he said for the very nature of NGOs, this problem cannot be handled by government's elite leadership and it's a problem of get a, get a this big sort of scale. And he said it basically requires the manifestation of a new cultural sense in the minds of people. So I was wondering if you agree with that, and what possible solutions would you suggest for that, if you agree on that? You know, it, uh, it, it, creating a culture is sort of easy to talk about, but it's, you know, it takes, takes a long time. Uh, you know, I just think, uh, uh, you know, the key thing is to propagate success stories. And it has a powerful impact in the world we live in today, you know, with easy access to information. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, organizations like AIF and all the NGOs we fund and other organizations like Prata and many others, you know, should talk about how they, you know, how they raise money, how they get people involved, how the money is spent, put their financials online so people have complete transparency. And I think the more transparent an organization is, and I think the more giving that organization is going to, you know, stimulate. So I, I think it's a long process, but uh, you know, sharing success stories is probably the first step. Thanks. Uh, good morning, I'm Fanindra, and firstly, inspiring work by you guys, and uh, it's an opportunity to be here. Um, firstly, I would like to ask you this question about the involvement of youth. Do you think India would have? a better future or would be in a better position if we focus uh, our primary sort of um, interest from high individuals to the involvement of you, encouragement and motivation of you. Do you think that would be in You know, it, the very large number of these three and a half million NGOs that we were referring to earlier are in fact started by very young people. Uh, and, and I think that's an extremely optimistic uh, and a hopeful uh, uh, sign. And, and uh, the, again, the, the challenge is how to mold uh, these uh, young people, support them uh, so that they can, uh, in fact, create uh, a more viable uh, uh, organization, a more viable movement. In and I, I think uh, if you look at the average age of NGO founders, it's, 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 it's young. And as, as Raj said, that uh, the average age of HNWI also continues to keep coming down. Uh, so both uh, on both sides, uh, the, the people who can actually give financial resources and people who are creating the... Uh, the you know, the social good, the general good. Uh, uh, on both sides, I think the, the average age is lower. I mean, I don't know if anybody else has an observation. So I find it extremely, I feel it's very optimistic uh, trends right now. I think 75% of India is under 25 or 26 years old. It's one of the youngest countries in the world demographically. So that's an extremely hopeful trend I mean, for India's growth. And I know China has got some demographic problems because of the one China situation, but India is actually in a pretty good position. Let me just add to uh, yeah. Cash. I think uh, one thing that you have to take in mind given the question of youth is many of the sort of uh, 
well-established, well-renowned NGOs that we see uh, today were perhaps established, uh, you know, post-emergency, uh, led by former Gandhian. So then the question really becomes, like, what is the succession plan? Is there a second line of leaderships? leadership? Will those institutions survive beyond the original founder, or will they kind of become obsolete and new forms of associations will evolve uh, based on the aspirations of this next generation? Let's take one from this side. Thank you, panelists. Uh, we heard about the opportunities and we discussed about how HNIs could come into the picture. So, uh, when HNIs come into the picture, especially question to Sushma is uh, we have been working, uh, we had worked in India on uh, managing the portfolios of philanthropy. So, I would like to know that how to identify the areas and sectors and the target groups in India when you have. Uh, lots of uh, available uh, areas which we need to cover. So how do you focus on it? And how was that you selected in areas of uh, funding? Okay. Um, so, um, you know, I was fortunate in a way to work for the Ford Foundation, which has a fairly broad mandate. At the time I worked there, its mission was to support innovative individuals and institutions worldwide. So you couldn't get any broader than that really. Um, so the foundation itself had sort of priority areas within which it worked, such as human rights, uh, governance, civil society, uh, women's rights, and so on. So uh, in large part the work on building the infrastructure uh, aligned with those interests. But those interests were so broad. Um, but I, I, you know, I would think of it as a, a, a different way, through a different lens. One is actually helping develop those philanthropic institutions themselves that were working on a range of issues. Uh, like I mentioned, it could be women, it could be a more community or geographically based approach. So helping those institutions themselves develop and evolve over time and helping them grow. Um, the second is funding for the infrastructure for the sector. So it's groups like research, capacity building, groups that are working in the legal regulatory framework, groups that are working on um, the transparency, accountability of the sector. So that whole infrastructure uh, was a big part of the portfolio. And then the um, ability to convene and learn from peers. So when I left Delhi and moved to New York, the project I was managing actually brought together philanthropic organizations from around the world that were really learning from each other and cross-fertilizing. So new foundations in Africa could go visit groups in India and say, you know, how did you develop your board? How did you raise money? Um, what are your best practices around transparency and so on. And so you have groups in Brazil, Africa, you know, all over the world really kind of coming together to learn from each other. So I saw through that lens sort of the actual philanthropic organizations, the capacity building, and then the convening and peer learning. We have very little time left, and I see four people say, so can you make your questions brief, and we'll be very brief in our answers. Sure. Uh, what are the leading causes that are attracting the most amount of philanthropic efforts in India? And I guess, what are people really passionate about when they talk about philanthropy or when they want to do philanthropy in India? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, do, you, do you have a, are you asking a question behind it? Yeah. Because we have so little time, let's just quickly ask all the questions. It's been mentioned that there are around 3.5 million NGOs. Do we have specific information about how functional they are? Or I had a very uh, disappointed trip to India where I had all the information, but when I contacted the office, very little activity going on at the grassroots level. Second, how many of them are religious versus secular? And how many of them have the funding status with India versus foreign? Or uh, how many of them are specifically working in the area of mental health, suicide prevention, rape victims? So it's very informative and helpful people like us who are sitting here want to do something. It, it's, it's, it's a high level information, but very really useful. Thank you. There are times when uh, NGO activity can kill uh, uh, sustaining enterprises. So are there any good practices which, and policy initiatives which uh, India should follow in future so that uh, NGO activities in certain sectors don't kill the sustaining and creation of sustainable enterprises? Okay, the last one. Thank you, panel. You are awesome. Uh, 
how can we make it easy for philanthropists, philanthropists and people who want to donate time and resources? So just make it easy for them. If you have any suggestions from your experiences. Okay. Uh, the first question was on which are the most pop, uh, uh, popular causes in India. Uh, my experience is broadly it's education. I mean. Uh, uh, culturally, there seems to be a, um, uh, you know, education is a very important part of uh, 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 breaking out of poverty at the end of the day. It's a longer term solution, but it nevertheless is a very fundamental. So my experience is education. And then uh, the second one broadly defined could be poverty alleviation or what we call livelihoods. Uh, those are the two things that come to my mind. Sadly, it should be public health as well that Ashok was referring to earlier. Uh, uh, but uh, that is not, does not have the same level of focus as I, in my experience, I mean, I'd like to see if anybody else has. I think the surveys that have been done identify those broadly as the two main areas in which most, both domestic as well as overseas or cross-border philanthropic efforts are going to uh, uh, in India. Um, in terms of, there's several questions that are related about the NGO community. Yes. Um, uh, India actually has uh, more innovation, more experience uh, with effective NGOs, uh, with the accountability and transparency issues than many countries do around Asia or beyond. Uh, and so it is possible to identify uh, not only NGOs that are doing effective work, uh, but also NGOs and NGO <coughs> communities that are pioneering um, uh, measures, uh, initiatives uh, toward accountability and transparency. Uh, one way of thinking about that, because it's a strand in many of these questions is how do I get involved, how do I find effective organizations, uh, how can I become involved with philanthropy back to India or toward India that either involves giving of my time or giving of my treasure. We usually talk about time and treasure and philanthropy. Um, and uh, there is a tendency to want to skip the intermediary organizations and go right to the organizations you're giving to. Uh, but sometimes that's not necessarily, especially if you're far away, the best approach. There are intermediary organizations, AIF being one, and there are others as well, that are well worth both your time and your donations uh, because they've developed systems to figure out which are the effective NGOs. They have some sense for this. And I'm not pushing AIF particularly, although I like AIF, there's lots of good organizations as well. When you're far away, the intermediary organizations, the organizations that have as their task figuring out effective programs and effective locally based groups can sometimes be, in many ways, the most effective groups to become parts of. Um, so let me do that. You know, it's a curious thing, but you know, most of us, if we wanted to build a new bathroom in our house, we always try and find plumbers, right? But somehow for philanthropy, everybody thinks they can just do it on their own. And they refuse to uh, learn from people who may have journeyed before them. And, and this is, I notice this all the time. So I, I would uh, second what Mark is saying. I mean, awareness, awareness. How do you improve your awareness? Do you have the time? Do you have, uh, but if you have, uh, if you want to do something right, it's better to uh, partner or work with people who have journeyed before you. I mean, then it may, the life would be a lot easier. I mean, that uh, how does somebody else ask the question of how can philanthropy be made easy? Uh, I would uh, echo the same response. I mean, work with people who have journeyed before you so you can go further and, and, uh, and can uh, use your time better. There's a last, one other question that uh, talked about best practices. I think. NGOs often um, uh, are, think that they are different as organizations, but you know, all organizations have similar issues, whether it is what uh, Sushma referred to as succession planning and optimizing uh, impact, I mean, uh, you know, balancing your books, uh, you know, your revenues, your expenses. All the issues are very similar to any business organization. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the goals are maybe different, but the practices are very similar. So I really don't see uh, unique uh, practices in that sector. I mean, I don't know, uh, Shushma, you and Mark may want to add, but we are out of time, and I had promised we will finish. I would simply like to sum up 
by making one other observation that was in one of these studies, which is the rate of uh, giving of income in India continues to increase dramatically. It's not quite to the US level that Rath mentioned, but it is approaching. Uh, uh, and 80% of Indian donors acknowledge they feel that they are novices, whereas 74% of donors in the United States feel that they are experienced. And earlier observation was made that the average age of a high net worth individual in India continues to come down. And so all I will sum up by saying that there is, it's a very optimistic landscape uh, for philanthropy. And, and uh, I think, um, and Raj also mentioned that, uh, you know, one cannot uh, just simply compare things with the United States. This has taken many, many years of building the ecosystem here, but I think the trends in India are positive. I think uh, 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 there is a glorious future for philanthropy in India, in my judgment. Thank you, everybody.